Hey everyone, welcome to a special preview edition of the Dan and Joe Sports Show of one of the most exciting weekends we've had in college football, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, LSU, all from Mississippi State. Some of the, the best games that are out there. Uh, as always, I'm Dan. And I'm Joe. All right, Joe, before we get to these massive, uh, massive matchups that we have this weekend, I think it's time for a little lock of the week. Our lock of the week, of course, is always brought to you by our fine sponsors, Hunter and Ginger Harrelson of Beach Ball Properties. Joe, it was 85 degrees outside. At one point, I was sweating profusely in a suit. It's November. It actually feels like beach weather. I couldn't believe it. This would actually be a good time to get onto Orange Beach and Gulf Shores, get in the sand, maybe get a little late fall uh, swim action, and go have a ball at the beach. Sounds good. All right, Jeb. Um, my lock of the week. We were talking about it at the end of last show. Oklahoma State just went down and had the worst loss in the history of being a top ten football team. They lost to Kansas State forty eight to nothing at the Little Apple. Joe, the Little Apple is a very uh, underrated venue. I remember Auburn in twenty fourteen. They had just come off of playing for a national championship. They lost to Jameis Winston with thirteen seconds, almost winning. They had a really talented team coming back in 2014. In many ways, the team that was more talented, their 2013 team. The first game of the season, they went to the Little Apple at Kansas State in Manhattan, Kansas, and they played a doozy of a game. Kansas State had them dead to rights for a long time. Auburn pulled out a squeaker. I remember Duke Williams had to make a sensational catch uh, to get Auburn uh, secure to the game on third down, and Auburn escaped with a win. That goes to say that Kansas State is not an easy place to play. Texas this year has been one of the most Jekyll and Hyde teams in America. When they're surrounded by the all-you-can-eat fry fest, the the 10-gallon hats, Bebo, that Texas sun, the beautiful hipster city of Austin, they do fantastic. They almost beat Alabama. They beat up on really good teams like West Virginia. But when you get them outside the sunny confines – of Texas State Capitol, when they go to Texas Tech and play a stadium that hosts about 32,000 people, they get beat. They go to Oklahoma State, blow a huge lead. Joe, this is the same Oklahoma State team that lost 48 to nothing to Kansas State last week. Oh, Texas this week is going on the road to the Little Apple in Manhattan, Kansas. And despite all these things I've said, Texas is somehow – not just ranked in the top 25, they're actually favored to win this game by two and a half points. Joe, wrong team favored. I don't need the points at two and a half. I like Kansas State straight up in this one. I could definitely see that, you know, for all the reasons you stated. Um, Seems like it's very likely uh, for Kansas State to win that game outright. The game I'm going to for my lock of the week is out to the Pacific Northwest in the Pac-12. And I like the Washington game over Oregon State. I feel like even though Oregon State is ranked at this point in the season at six and two, Washington's also six and two. And I feel like with Michael Penix Jr. being one of the more prolific passers this year in college football, I think they're going to defeat the Beavers by a more than a sizable advantage. And I saw the that the line is favoring uh, Washington just by four and a half. Joe, is that game in Seattle? It's in Seattle, I believe. Okay, well, I like that. I think Washington actually has a very good home field advantage. Interestingly, Joe, I've heard they have the same locker uh, room situation that Michigan does. We have a single tunnel that leads into the locker rooms, which uh, we can talk about how that's been a huge issue with Michigan. And, you know, a couple times this year, Penn State and Michigan State. Last week, of course, with the four Michigan State guys jumping the one Michigan player. But point being, uh, Washington can have a pretty raucous environment and really good fans, and I really like them at home against Oregon State, especially with the great talent of Michael Penix Jr. I think that's a solid bet to take the Huskies at four and a half. Right. All right, Joe. Um, you know, we talked about last last game the show, Notre Dame came out of nowhere and beat up on Syracuse. Syracuse, pretty good football team. Got a good defense. Got a great running back. And Clemson comes in after barely beating Syracuse. I mean, they, they only beat him by one possession. Uh, I remember hearing there was a lot of questionable calls from the referees in that game, which, you know, not saying anything, but it does seem like that Clemson seems to get a lot of those calls when they need to. And suddenly they're taking on Notre Dame, and Notre Dame's a little hot right now. 
Uh, I didn't think this game was going to be that interesting for most of the season. I kind of expected Clemson just wipe the floor with them. Some of this game, I'm not going to sit here and say it's compelling, but it's got a little bit of interest I have in this game now. Yeah, I think that uh, it's one of those games where it's going to be interestingly the sight of DJ's uh, really good performance two years ago in a losing effort for Clemson. He'll get to return there. We'll see how he plays, you know, at Notre Dame this time. And it seems like Notre Dame suddenly has some renowned life on the season with Marcus Freeman. So maybe they make it interesting. But at the same time, I kind of want to see how close the game, you know, plays out. I definitely like Clemson to win. I just want to see by what margin. Well, Joe, let me ask you this. Uh, Dabo has said that he's going to stick with DJ at quarterback and that even though he benched him against Syracuse and put in Clay, Cade Klubnick, uh, you saw Cade Klubnick, I think, throw, what, three passes for like 15 yards. Yeah. Do you think there's a legitimate quarterback controversy, and do you think that we see Cade Klubnick go out there and start for Clemson, or do we see DJ out there again? No, I think I think it's DJ out there again, and it's because Klubnick has not, you know, gone out there and just uh, – went off with big stats, you know, only throwing for 15 yards to me is just not enough at this uh, point for him to be the starter. Well, Joe, here's the thing I think too, like generally when you have quarterback competitions, they go out and they put the backup in, you see him actually do something. He shows that he's worthy of a job. When you got Dabo out there and he's throwing three times for 15 yards, that means he doesn't trust him to actually throw the ball. Mm-hmm. No, that, that's a point, good point as well. Yeah, Joe, this is uh, one that, you know, I almost consider making this my lock of the week. Even though Notre Dame is playing a lot better, these are the games that Clemson traditionally flexes and shows that they are the kings of the ACC and they are a team that's worthy of being in the playoffs. Clemson had some ugly games this year. I mean, they went toe-to-toe with Wake Forest in overtime, which at the time I thought Wake Forest was a really good team. I thought that was more of a reflection on Wake Forest than it was on Clemson. And then last week happened, and Sam broke my heart, man. Um, But, you know, this one, this team has been a little disappointing at times. But I feel like this is a game where you're going to see Clemson show who they are, and Notre Dame's going to show what they really are this year, which Notre Dame is is a team that will make a bowl game, not a great bowl game, and I think probably like a 7-5 and type team. And right now Clemson is still number four in the college football playoff rankings. Yeah, I think they're going to say there after they win this game. Okay. Now, I think Clemson definitely wins. I could see it being within 10 points, though. Okay. I, I'm, I would take Clemson to win this game by about 14 points, I think. Like maybe like a 30-17 okay. type score. Because I don't really trust Drew Pine against this, Notre Dame, against this Clemson defense. That's really one of the bigger things. I think DJ has shown improvement this year. He hasn't been a great quarterback. And Notre Dame's got a pretty good defense. But I trust him a lot more than I trust, uh, you know, a rookie, a freshman quarterback at Notre Dame against a really great Clemson uh, defense. So I think that I can see Clemson maybe get a defensive touchdown, a couple of turnovers. I like Clemson like 31 to 17. I think it's a sneaky, interesting game because it will get kind of buried nationally behind LSU, Bama. But I think it could be an interesting night game. Joe, speaking of interesting night games, uh, you know, we get all kinds of games at night. Here's one that's going to be under the radar for most people as, you know, unless you're a football masochist or you have a rooting interest in Auburn like me, you probably don't really care about this one that much. But Auburn Mississippi State took on a whole new level of interesting when A, Brian Harson got fired and Cadillac Williams got promoted to interim head coach. And B, even more importantly for this game, uh, John Cohen left being the athletic director of Mississippi State and went across state lines and now is Auburn's athletic director and he's got to return to Starkville on Saturday as the athletic director of Auburn. Adds a little added level of intrigue to a game that otherwise would be, you know, SEC bottom dwellers playing each other. Yeah, that was the only weird thing about the Cohen hire for me was that he didn't wait a week later to take the job. I, I did find that timing odd, you know, especially if he's going to be moving to Auburn, he's going to be have you know having to go to Starkville back and forth unless he, unless he gets, I guess, a moving company you know, relocating and everything. So it just seemed kind of odd to me. Yeah, it is weird that you think that would happen this week, or you would have thought maybe it would have happened the week before so you don't have it literally be the week that they're playing Mississippi State. I mean, of course, it has zero impact on the game. 
Uh, there might be some people that try to shake cowbells in his head face and are really angry at him when he comes back to Mississippi State. If he goes to that game, I mean, I, I wouldn't blame him if he wanted to sit this one out and maybe get more acquainted with the city of Auburn and watch it somewhere there. Yeah, no, that, that, that'd that be a good point, too. Um, but, you know, this is a game where really I would have thought that if they had held on to Harson, this would be maybe one of the more winnable games. And I still think maybe it is. Auburn actually matches up better with Mississippi State this year than they do than just about any other SEC team because what have we seen, Joe? Auburn has a very porous run defense. Actually, believe it or not, one of the only things they're good at, their passing defense is one of the best in the SEC. They got some really good uh, secondary players. Zion Puckett's been playing well. Uh, Nehemiah Pritchett looks like maybe a guy who could be an NFL player at corner, which Auburn's had a good run of those lately. Um you know, Mississippi State doesn't run the ball. They use their short passing game uh, as they're running or there's a rushing attack. I think this is going to be um, – this might be a game that is going to be closer than most people thought. I mean, I think, you know, being on the road definitely got a favor of Mississippi State in that. Um, but I'm interested to see what this Auburn team comes out and plays for Cornell Williams, who, I mean, as Junior Rosegreen said, Cornell's a really high-energy guy. He's going to get them going. I mean – you know, the man, like, when he was an Auburn player, he really got people fired up. Big trash talker. I'm sure he's going to get uh, these players uh, playing hard for him this week. And I'm just fascinated to see what the Auburn football team is that comes out against Mississippi State with a new room head coach. Mm-hmm. No, that that's certainly going to be interesting. And Mississippi State, you know, on their side, this is their first game since uh, losing to Alabama the way they did two weeks ago. So I want to see, you know, how they come out because – you know, their season went from really promising to just, you know, really tough, really in, a, in the blink of an eye. Yeah, it really did. Because, I mean, you know, they come off, they beat Arkansas really badly. They they come in to play a Kentucky team that, you know, has been – looks pretty bad, lost in the South Carolina the week before. And all of a sudden, Kentucky beats them pretty badly. And then they go out and Alabama just waxes them. And yet again, Mississippi State barely gets any points. I mean, we talked about it last show, I think, that – in like the last like four years or something, Mississippi State has scored like 15 points against Alabama. It's pathetic. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how Mississippi State comes out this week too. Definitely two teams at very low points in the season. And, you know, this game is one that can maybe potentially catapult Auburn to have a chance to make a bowl game. That for sure gets Mississippi State to a bowl game. And I think it's all going to be about whether Auburn can establish the run against Zach Arnett's defense and can they stop the passing game of Will Rogers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's pretty much all State obviously is going to do. Exactly. Um, Jerry, I think that this is going to be a game where I'm going to take State to win it, but I think it's going to be close. I think this might end up being a one-possession game. A lot of times, like I said, you see these teams come out and play really hard for their interim coach. I think if Harson was still the coach, I'll maybe say Mississippi State wins this game by 14 plus points. I'm going to lean towards Mississippi State winning this game, but put me as someone who's not shocked if somehow Carnell Williams gets a SEC win in this first ever game. Yeah, that's kind of the way I see it as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to say Mississippi State wins the game 35 to 31, but if that score, if those scores are flipped, I'm not surprising the least. Right, absolutely. All right, Joe, huge road trip for Alabama. Uh, right now, LSU's got to be the most surprising team in the SEC. I mean, looking at where they were earlier in the season, uh, they lose to a bad Florida State team. They go out and, you know, they go to Jordan-Hare Stadium and should have lost to what's a really bad Auburn team. I mean, Auburn had them down 17 to nothing. Um, they rebound a little bit, beat Mississippi State, uh, you know, come back on them in the fourth quarter. Um you know, they get absolutely blitzed by Tennessee, 41 to 17 in Baton Rouge. Got to be one of the more epic beatdowns that we've ever seen happen uh, down in Death Valley. Um, you know, LSU's picking up things. They win a good game against Florida. Then all of a sudden, they just go haymaker in the second half against Ole Miss, outscore them. I think it's 28 to three in the second half. And they put a whooping on the Rebels. And now suddenly, LSU sitting there number 10 in the college football playoff rankings ahead of LS, ahead of Ole Miss, only got one loss. Um, LSU is is in the catbird seat in the SEC West. They went out. They're going to be the SEC West champions. And, Joe, I mean, not only that, I think they have 
You know, in 2017, Auburn had a great chance at being the first two-loss team to ever make the college football playoff. LSU sitting in a position where if they went out, they're going to go to the college football playoff, even with two losses. And suddenly this is a very interesting game, and um, Alabama has definitely shown that they're not the same Crimson Tide team on the road that they are at home. No, no, not at all. And what was the line on this game? Wasn't it Alabama about 14 and a half? 14, 14 and a half, man. Now, uh, you know, people always want to bet high on Alabama, and a lot of times they're right about it. A lot of times when they have a line like this, there's something we don't know. But, Joe, I've watched LSU and Alabama lately, and, yes, Alabama won 30-6 to against Mississippi State, and that's the last game they had after losing to Tennessee. But their offense didn't look that impressive in that game. That was their defense playing good. And this is going to be really fascinating to see – Bryce Young had to put an entire game on his shoulders against Tennessee, and he put up a valiant effort. They didn't win. But this LSU defense is better than that Tennessee defense. The rush defense, maybe a slight edge Tennessee, but when it comes to the secondary, huge advantage LSU than what you saw uh, over Tennessee. And LSU's got like a top 20 defense right now. Brian Kelly is really showing his chops as a head coach. It seems like this LSU team gets better every single week. And uh, this is a tough game to call, man. Yeah, no, it is. And, I, you know, I think I told you before the show, if it was me picking the line, I might favor Bama by like two, or I might even make this a pick them, and I wouldn't be shocked. Because here's the, the ultimate thing for me is that you've got Bryce Young, which makes you want to favor Alabama. But at the same time, Jaden Daniels is playing with more confidence than any quarterback not named Hendon Hooker right now. I mean, that guy's just on fire with the numbers he's putting up against Florida and Ole Miss the last few weeks. And so I really think this is going to be a barn burner of a game. And it's really tough for me to get a good read on where to lean. I think with the game being at LSU makes it you know really tough on Bama as well. Yeah, Joe, I mean, you look at what Jaden Daniels has done lately, and I think the offensive coordinator at Tennessee has started to use uh, – at LSU has really started to use Jaden Daniels' skill set better. It's it's obvious that Jaden Daniels is not a great read quarterback. He's not going to hit his second and third options very often. He's never going to hit his fourth options. But he's a great runner, and he's got a quick release and a strong arm. So I think LSU lately has really worked an offense in that – he has a zone read option. He's got his number one guy at receiver. And if that's not there, he takes off and runs. He's a great runner. You also get a lot more design QB runs. And I think since they simplified this offense, stop trying to have him, like, go through so many progressions down to his third and fourth option, which he's not going to hit. He's become a more accurate passer, more reliable. And I think he's just seeing the field better without having to worry about having to sit there in the pocket. Mm-hmm. No, a- absolutely. I think that, you know, th- those are really good points there. And, you know, he's also a quarterback that, you know, with his speed, um, you wouldn't expect him to be 6'5". And there's something about him as an athlete that, you know, really impresses me as well. And so, yeah, I, I really expect a really close game. Um, I think, you know, you have to give that slight edge to Alabama. Um, I think just something about Bryce Young in these types of games gives me a little bit more confidence. But, I would not be shocked at all to see LSU win this game. Joe, I'm kind of in the same boat. I think Alabama wins this game because of Bryce Young and because of a little bit more, um, you know, a a little bit better of a defense. I think that the Will Anderson, Dallas Turner defense, Kool-Aid McKinstry, there's a little bit more talent on Alabama's defense. Uh, You know, Jaden Daniels hasn't really done well against a good defense. Mm-hmm. Um, Ole Miss's defense is pretty good, but it's kind of gone off a little bit lately. They're also, you know, susceptible to the run. Mm-hmm. One thing that's going to be hard for LSU is they're not a team that goes out and throws for 400 yards very often. And Jaden Daniels, even though he's a running quarterback, Alabama's got the kind of guys like Will Anderson that can chase him down. So I don't think he's going to be able to get 130 yards rushing in this one. Um, LSU's got some really good wide receivers. Obviously, Kayshawn Butte is a great talent. He hasn't really had the best attitude this year and hasn't had his best season. I think Butte has a chance to really take advantage of Alabama's defense. I'm not saying he's going to score five touchdowns like Jalen Hyatt did, but I could see Butte getting, you know, one to two, maybe even three touchdowns in this game. 
But the thing that worries me is I don't see LSU developing a rushing attack against Alabama. And I think for LSU to win any of these kind of big games, they have to be able to run the ball. Yet again, what was one of Tennessee's better defensive efforts? It's against LSU because they were a rushing team. And that's what they did against Kentucky, too. I think Bama shuts down the run in this game. Jaden Daniels is rendered not quite as uh, is fantastic as he has been the last couple of weeks. And, you know, and I look for, for Bryce Young to maybe make a mistake. He could throw a turnover. He might throw an interception. I don't see Gibbs having a huge game. But I see Alabama kind of gutting out a win in this one. I'm looking at something maybe like a 28 to 20 type score. I like Alabama. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of um, the type of game that Alabama with Blake Sims had played down there in 2014. Obviously, you know, Sims a lot different than having Bryce Young. But I just think it's going to be a really close game that wouldn't surprise me if it went to overtime. Yeah, Joe, I could see this one going to overtime too. I mean, I think that, you know, anytime you get to the fourth quarter in a game in Tiger Stadium when, you know, they put up it's – it's, uh, it's Saturday night in Death Valley. You know, when that, like, thing comes out, they start playing calling Baton Rouge. It's a, it's a great atmosphere. But I just think that this offense is a little too limited to beat this Alabama team. Mm-hmm. I could see that. Yeah, so I'm going to lean Alabama in this one. Uh, and actually, as an Ole Miss fan that's wanting to see Ole Miss make their first ever SEC West uh, championship, uh, get SEC West title and make the first SEC championship ever, well, this fans actually have to cheer for Alabama in this one. What a strange thing that is. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those games on the schedule where you don't really want to pull for either team. But, yeah, you kind of have to pull for, for Alabama. All right, Joe. The showcase of the weekend and what I'm so excited about, and, Joe, and you've now talked about this, a game where I've completely fl- flipped my mindset in the course of the week. I was so impressed with Tennessee all year from going to Pitt winning that game. I didn't think they win that one. They got the big win there. Then they go and they take care of Florida at the Swamp in college game day. I mean, take care of Florida at home when college game day comes. Really great step for Tennessee in a series that really Florida is pretty dominated much for most of it lately. Um, you know, you keep taking those steps. They go down to Baton Rouge. They beat LSU 41-17, to beat the brakes off them. And then, of course, they get Alabama to come for the second college game day to Knoxville. The city of Knoxville burns down. There's a uh, goalpost being thrown in the Tennessee River. Tennessee fills the air with cigar smoke, and they beat Alabama for the first time in 15 years, 52 to 49. Well, Joe, they're suddenly playing the best defense they've played all season, the defending national champions in Georgia, and the number one team in the college football play- playoff rankings in Tennessee, the number three team in Georgia. And, Joe, this is going to be just an epic showdown. Yeah, I mean, it is, you know, having both these teams undefeated with so much on the line. And after this, you know, Tennessee's had so many big tests, but this is obviously the ultimate final exam for them because the rest of the slate is very manageable, having to play teams like Missouri and South Carolina, you know, so really just not a whole lot in Vanderbilt after that. So not not really anything after this. So they could kind of coast to, you know, maybe a Heisman Trophy winning season for Hendon Hooker. And I think that for me – Hooker can make the difference in this game because we've always talked about and credited him and his ability, not just as a passer with 21 touchdowns this year, but that touchdown interception ratio is just otherworldly at 21 to one. And I have concerns about Stetson Bennett turning the ball over, being more prone to do that. Like you said before the show earlier, um, having two interceptions against Florida. And so I'm worried about him making one or two many mistakes in Tennessee with Hooker, um, you know, they, they've proven that they can show up in big games and still perform well. And I think that, that Hooker makes the difference in this game. And so I'm probably kind of surprisingly leaning towards Tennessee to win. Joe, I think this is going to be just a fabulous football game. I mean, Georgia yet again has the best defense in the SEC. I think they have the second best scoring defense in America right now after only I think Illinois has got the best one. Um, Michigan's probably up there too. But, Joe, there's a couple players that are going to be out for Georgia that I think are huge deals. So, Jalen Carter on the defensive line, uh, one of their top draft picks going into this season, he's been out. He's going to be out this game. And, Joe, even more importantly, 
Nolan Smith, the heart and soul of that Georgia defense, just got ruled out for the entire season. And, Joe, that is a huge loss. Of course, this Georgia team is very deep, but I heard that a lot of the players last year, even on the dance team of destruction defense, that, you know, I had to put Junior Rosegreen on the spot and ask them whether they were better than the Auburn 04 defense. That great defense, they all said that Nolan Smith was the best player on their defense and that he was the heart and soul of their defense. And so he returns this season, you know, picks up right where he left off. Him not being in this game is massive. Jalen Carter not being in the game is big, but no one Smith's absence will be felt. Hendon Hooker's a very mobile quarterback. Having that great middle linebacker in there, the captain of your defense, to watch him and spy him, not having him in there leads up for the run for Hendon Hooker. Uh, Tennessee's got some good running backs. That makes it more likely that they can, you know, they can maybe bust a couple big runs on Georgia. And more importantly, Tennessee's got the best slot receiver in America, that being Jalen Hyatt. The dude is a freaking, like, cheetah. He's so fast. Uh, that maybe makes it to where maybe the middle of Georgia's defense can get attacked a little bit, and maybe we could see Jalen Hyatt yet again have a big game. Because he's got what, like, I know a lot of them were in the Alabama game. I think 14 touchdowns already on the season with, you know, four games to go in the regular season. And I saw a stat today that really kind of surprised me historically that this Tennessee offense, you know, we knew that they were great, but they're historically great to the tune that they're averaging more points per game than LSU's 2019 offense with um, um, with Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow. So, I mean, to me, that just, just speaks volumes for how dominant this team's been. Now, this uh, this Tennessee offense is on a whole new level. I mean, even when we were talking about last show, Junior Rosegreen was giving a lot of credit to Josh Heupel with how great this, this offense is and how fantastic Hendon Hooker is. And, Joe, I think that Hendon Hooker is going to get his. I think Jalen Hyatt and Cedric Tillman, Brew McCoy, they're going to have good games. But here's the reason I'm picking the Tennessee Vols to win. Byron Young and that Tennessee defensive line – very underrated unit, keep getting better every week. They held LSU to 17 points. They held down Jamar Gibbs to a large degree in that Alabama game, shut down Will Levis and Chris Rodriguez, only gave up six points. Georgia's calling card is running the football. It always has been under Kirby. And Stetson Bennett, he's done some things better this year, but he still makes mistakes in big games when they're tight. This game is going to be tight, and I expect Stetson Bennett to make mistakes, and I don't see Georgia getting 300 yards rushing against Tennessee. Joe, I'll be surprised they get over 150 yards against this very good Tennessee defensive line. And while Georgia's got a lot of uh, weapons, especially the tight end position, Brock Bowers, Darnell Washington, Eric Gilbert, I think that Stetson Bennett's going to make one too many mistakes, and I like Tennessee to keep up their dream season, even on the road between the hedges. I think Tennessee pulls off the upside. Yeah, I think so, too. I concur with that analysis. And, you know, I saw him at the shock with the line with Alabama being favored by the margin they were. Similarly surprised that Georgia's favored by eight points against number one Tennessee. Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised that Georgia's favored, but I am surprised they're favored by eight points. Just to to me, this seems like the makings of, you know, like a two to three point game, like swing either way. Yeah, I, I would probably put Georgia, yeah, like one and a half, two points, something in that range, because I think they deserve the nod for having not lost a game, winning the national championship last year, and being at home. But eight points is a whole lot. Um, and like I said, in the end, I think that Tennessee's defensive line is going to win this game by yet again showing that they have one of the best rush defenses in America. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'd be a big statement. It would be. We'll see if, uh, if Hooker and the boys and the hype train keep it going against the Georgia Bulldogs and what's going to be just a great matchup and, uh, you know, keep alive Joe and I's hopes for an Ole Miss-Tennessee SEC championship to end all SEC championships. And then also, you know, just the compelling subplot of how close the game is, you know, if the loser's 11-1, and one, the debates, you know, that we're going to hear for the next month too. Absolutely, Joe. I think that it has to be Tennessee, though, for that. I don't think that Georgia is going to have done enough without without winning this game to make the college football playoff if they don't get to play in the SEC championship. I really don't. I mean, I guess their biggest calling card will be that they beat uh, Oregon really bad, 49-3, to and that would be their best argument. 
But I don't think this Georgia team would get make the college football playoff without um, making it to the SEC championship. Now, I think that Tennessee can lose this game in a close game, rest on their laurels the rest of the season, their big wins over Pitt, Florida, uh, Tennessee, LSU, I mean, LSU, Alabama, all those big wins they had, Kentucky. And I think they'll be okay. But I don't think Georgia's got enough meat on the bone. So I think that if this were going to be a team that loses and still makes a college football playoff, I think it has to be Tennessee. Well, I think regardless, and even for Georgia to be in the conversation, both teams would need some help. Like, I think it would take, obviously, you know, the the winner beating um, Alabama or LSU in the SEC championship game, and then also getting some help with some of these other teams losing nationally. You know, luckily, Ohio State and Michigan are going to play each other. So here's a question for you. Let's say that Georgia uh, beats Tennessee – goes to the SEC championship, but they play LSU in the SEC championship, and LSU wins, does Tennessee get in over a two-loss LSU that they destroyed? I mean, that would be a really tough debate, and that would actually be a nightmare situation for the committee because you don't have the 12-team playoff yet. Yeah. I mean, you talk about, like, the the committee pulling their hair out. You have to choose between a two-loss SEC champion you never denied an SEC champion from getting in the college football playoff. You've also never had a two-loss team in the college football playoff. And you'd have to choose between them and a team that only has one loss and a team that absolutely destroyed the team that has two losses. You know, yeah. this, this, you know what this situation would be just like, Joe? Penn yeah. State and Ohio State back in, was that 2016? That's exactly what well, the words are in my mouth. Yep, that's what I was thinking about. Yeah. So, I mean, there's precedent for it. But, man, that would be some chaos. Mm-hmm. It really would be. Yep. All right. Well, Joe, here's the chaos, and here's to hoping that uh, Tennessee can keep on their undefeated season, and I guess that Alabama beats LSU so that Ole Miss has a chance to win that see off. That's right. All right. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening. Thank having Junior Rose Green on the show earlier. The Auburn great, always a welcome guest on the show. Uh, you can like all of our old uh, videos and follow us on Spotify. Uh, we have all of our episodes uploaded on Spotify. Of course, we also have our YouTube channel. You can subscribe to that and see us in live and living color. And you can also follow us on Twitter at DJ Sports Show. And as always, I'm Dan. And I'm Joe.